So since it's been a while, let's take a look at what we did last week. Um, and we're going to build on it with some more sophisticated queries in Mongo um, today. So last week we focused on MongoDB. Um, got a little introduction to it as a, as a uh, document, flexible document-based database. Um, and so we saw how we have to like require the node module for MongoDB. Um, we also required a new node module.env, which lets us read environment variables, variables associated with like the running process um, that are specified in the .env file. This .env file um, is what has the Mongo URI, which we don't put in our code. We put in the .env file because it contains our username and password to the Mongo database. So we certainly don't want to commit that to GitHub um, or share it in any way where um, it might be compromised. So that's why we use the .env. And we'll use .env for more and more secrets um, as we do more web app type stuff. But for now, it's just our Mongo URI. Um, and then we wrote this asynchronous function. So like the big thing we learned in addition to Mongo was asynchronous functions and promises a little bit. Um, and we'll touch on those a little bit more today. So a function um, that doesn't immediately return a value, um, we have to label as asynchronous. This function has to be asynchronous because we're making asynchronous calls within this function, such as like connect and um, print all is another asynchronous function. Um, and to array is an asynchronous function. Oh, I have too much code in here, sorry. I got ahead of myself, I was practicing. We only made it this far. There we go. Um, not even that far. There we go. Um, so what we did before is we connected to the MongoDB client. This is where it connects to the MongoDB database specified in our environment variable here. Um, so the connection is actually made. Once we're connected to the database, um, or once we're connected to the, the server, we then specify a specific database on that server we're interested in. And the name of our database is sample guides. There could be multiple databases all on the server. Um, within the sample guides database, which is something I just got from Mongo, um, we are specifically wanting to access the planets collection. Okay, that's what we're focused on. Um, so we get a reference here to the planets collection inside the sample guides database um, that's on the Mongo server um, that we specified up here. Okay, so this is all like our connection um, code. What we then did, uh, yeah. Oh. What we then did was we uh, used the find method on the collection, um, which returns what we call a cursor. Think of it as like a Java iterator. Um, and it returns um, that cursor to all documents within the collection. Um, the server has databases. Each database has multiple collections. Each collection can have multiple documents. That's the structure within MongoDB. So this gives us a cursor to all the documents in the planet's collection. Um, and then we call this asynchronous method printall, which we wrote just to print all of those documents. So if we scroll down here to the print all function. It's marked as asynchronous because it's making asynchronous calls um, like has next. Um, and has next is asynchronous. So we have to wait for the promise. It returns a promise and we have to wait for that promise to be resolved um, before we continue. And that's what the await keyword lets us do. Um, so has next, very similar to the has next method on a Java iterator. And then we call the next method if it, there is something there. Again, very similar to the next method on a Java iterator. Um, but again, it's asynchronous, so we have to call await here. Um, all of this is wrapped in a try finally. So if there's any issues here, perhaps uh, we, we didn't specify the right password and our connection fails, we still want to make sure we, we close the client regardless. Whether we finish successfully or on an error, 
the finally block in a try catch block will always be executed. And so it gives us an opportunity to close the connection um, to the Mongo database. Um, so all this whole block here is just a function, right? Here is where we actually invoke the function run. Um, and then we're using the catch method here too. So like if it does fail, um, we're going to uh, log that to the console. Um, so if the promise is rejected, um, we will print it out. Okay. One thing I, that came up um, regarding promises, but we, we ran out of time last week, was like what they look like if we don't wait or what happens if we don't wait. So I want to make a temporary change here just to illustrate that to you. Um, so for example, let's say when we are implementing our print all function here, we waited for the has, so has next returns a promise. We're waiting for that promise to be resolved. Cool. But let's say we just called cursor.next and we didn't have the await word here. So we're, we're not, cursor.next returns a promise and we're not waiting for that promise to be resolved. We're just immediately logging it. Let's see what that looks like when we run it. Um, because you might see stuff like this before or like in the future. So here it says all planets, and then look, it just prints out the promise object, okay? So because we didn't wait for the promise to be resolved to a value, when we do the console.log here, what we're logging is the promise object. And that's why it says promise and it's just pending, okay? Um, so if you're debugging and you see a value of a variable is a promise and you expect it to be like an actual value, like a number or a string or something, maybe you didn't wait for the promise to be resolved. Okay, so I wanted to point that out. I think that's an important thing for you to see. So I'm gonna put the await back in here um, so that now we're gonna wait for that promise to be resolved. And so if I run this code again, we now see that it actually prints out all those objects um, from the, the Mongo documents. So a little more information there on the await and on promises. Historically, this idea of asynchronous code and promises um, is, is one of the, the biggest challenges we have as we develop our web apps. We're just not familiar with that concept based on our experience in, in Java. All right, let's, um, let's add some more useful code. Let's go back up here. So we found all the documents, we printed them all out. Um, there are many more sophisticated ways that we can search or query um, documents within a Mongo collection. So, um, and then how we can organize those as well. So let's do a few different of those. Um, here's the first one. Um, Sometimes just getting um, the cursor is exactly what we want. Sometimes we might immediately want all of the documents um, just stored in an array because we're going to like work with all of them. So if you want all the elements in the cursor, uh, all the elements referenced by the cursor, as an array, use the to array function. Here's what that looks like. So we'll do cursor collection dot find again. And then we'll create another variable called planets. This will be our array of planet objects. We'll call a wait because this to array method is asynchronous as well. So cursor dot to array. So the to array method returns a promise. We're going to wait for that promise to be resolved. When it's resolved, it will be an array of objects, in this case, our planets. So then we can just say console dot log all planets, planets as an array. And then we can just easily log the whole array.
I find this super convenient because we can certainly write code like we wrote down here with the has next to next and all of that stuff. Um, but a lot of times, if we're smart about how we search through a collection, what is returned by the cursor is exactly what we want. And it's more easily, it's more easy for us to work with it um, in JavaScript if we have it as, as an array. So let's run this. So if I scroll up a little bit, it says all planets as array. So you'll notice it's, we've got the square brackets here, which designate, hey, this is an array. Here's the first element in the array, which is this particular planet object, second element, so on and so forth. So that's a really easy way to get it to be an array. And you'll do that in the, uh, the lab practical practice. You'll use that to array function as well. All right, um, we, could, we could get by with just this. And then we could iterate through the array and check like various conditions in terms of the documents. But it's much more efficient to have the Mongo server do the hard work of the query and just return the data that we need, okay? In this case, there's only like a handful of planets, right? It's not that big a deal. We're not transferring that much data. But imagine we had like a million documents in this Mongo collection. We wouldn't want to re return and transfer over the network a million documents only so our JavaScript code could like filter through them. Instead, we want that querying, that, that selection to occur on the server. And we do that by specifying additional parameters to the find function. Um, so here's some examples of that. All right, let's do, what do we want to search for first? Um, let's only focus on planets that have rings, okay? So find with a query object, it's called a query object, will return a cursor to all documents that match the query. These can get really sophisticated. We're gonna keep it relatively straightforward because that's all we really need right now. So here's how it looks. We do cursor equals collection.find again. But now we pass as a parameter an object. So we're gonna create an object right here in between the parentheses with our object literal. That's the curly bracket thing that you may remember from our JavaScript stuff. And we're gonna specify in our query object here, the property we want to search for and um, the value we expect it to be. So the property we wanna search for is has rings. That's one of the properties in this document. And we only want those planets where the has rings property is true. And then we'll do console.log planets with rings. And then we'll do await print all. And we'll print, we'll use our print all thing for the cursor. Okay. So this is exactly the same as what we did with our first find here, except now we pass as a parameter or as an argument, um, a query object, object literal here, where the has rings property is set to true. And so if I run this code and scroll down to the end, planets with rings, you'll notice that Saturn the uh, object for Saturn is returned. It has rings is true. Neptune rings true. Uranus rings true. Jupiter rings true. All the other planets have been filtered out. Okay. Again, in this case, not a huge deal, but if there were millions of documents and we wanted four of them, this would be so much more efficient. Okay. Let's do, yeah. Great question. Yes, we are able to specify multiple values. So let's see how that works. There can be multiple properties in the query, oops, in the query object and all must match. So it's an and. So let's see what that looks like. Cursor equals collection.find. Here's our object literal. Let's say we want has rings to be true. 
and we're going to add a second property such that the main atmosphere at musphere contains argon argon so if the property we're specifying is itself an array our main atmospheres are arrays of elements um, this just means it, the array contains this particular value not like it's the only thing in the array and then we can do console.log planets oh let's do without rings i think it'll be more interesting false false for rings and then we'll say planets without rings and with argon in the atmosphere and then we'll do another print all like that okay so now we have two properties within our query object has rings must be false and the main atmosphere must contain argon there is a syntax to do like ors as well um we're just going to focus on ands for now question or is that the question that's the question okay ands are more common so they're just more natural in terms of the syntax all right so now if we run this we will see planets without rings and with argon in the atmosphere so here's mars no rings main atmosphere yep contains argon here's the earth no rings main atmosphere contains argon there we go cool In addition to querying multiple properties, you can also do like um, comparisons. So let's do an example of that. Operators can be specified. Uh, here's our some of our operators. LT is less than, GT is greater than, GT or LTE is less than or equal to, GTE greater than or equal to. We can do equal to, we can do not equal to, we can do in, like um, contains within the array. We can do n in for not in. These are all different operators that we can specify. So let's see some examples of that. Cursor, collection.find. All right, in our query object, um, Let's say we want to look for planets where the mean surface temperature is less than 15 degrees Celsius, okay? So to do this, we can actually specify, let me comment this out real quick. I want to show you like what the output looks like from before. So here's the surface temperature. The surface temperature C property its value is an object. We know it's an object because of the curly brackets here, right? So let's contrast that with main atmosphere. Main atmosphere, that property is, a, is an array because we see the square brackets. So it's an array of strings. Surface temperature C property is an object because of these curly brackets. And this object has three properties, min, max, and mean. So in our query, we can actually refer to properties within the object, okay? So these Mongo queries can be pretty sophisticated. Um, when we're doing that, we need to use quotes though. Notice like we just said has rings here as the property. Here we need to put it in quotes because we're gonna use the dot. So we're gonna say surface temperature C, the name has to match exactly, dot mean, so the mean property of the surface temperature C property, um, if that, um, before equal was implied, and we just had the values like true, false, string AR, but here we wanna do a comparison. So we actually build up another object. And inside of these curly brackets, we're gonna have the operator in this case, less than, and that, property will have a value of 15. So this is a little more sophisticated. We're now referring to a property within a property. We're specifying 
an operator here by instead of just having a value for our query object, we're having another embedded object with the property dollar sign less than is 15. Okay. And then let's do another console.log and we'll print out planets with average surface temperatures less than 15 degrees Celsius. And we'll do another await. To print it all out. Let me run this. Planets with average surface temperatures less than 15 degrees C. Here is Saturn. Yep, it's cold. Mars, also cold. Neptune, very cold. Earth, uh, cold today, and on average, less than. Um, Uranus, cold, and Jupiter, cold. Lots of cold. But I think you'll see between these examples, we can craft some very sophisticated queries um, between the use of the operators and multiple conditions. Um, there, there's so much we can do. Uh, it is more efficient to specify these query objects instead of just doing it all in JavaScript. Okay, so the more we can offload on the MongoDB server to do these types of queries, um, the better. We're not going to focus on this in, in this class, um, but, but just as an, a point of reference and a potential extension, if you're curious, you can set up entire what they call pipelines with Mongo where you can pass like the results of these queries through multiple different steps, transforming the data as it goes, um, which can be like super powerful and really efficient because all that work is done on the server and not like on the client. Um, so very cool stuff.